you. Um, it's, it's dangerous to predict, especially about the future, but if you were to elaborate a little bit on how the social trends will affect the regime, what are the time schedule for changes in North Korea, the way you see it? Are we talking about five years, 10 years, 15 years? Um, so it's, it's a really important question, but it's also an incredibly difficult question and, and probably an impossible question, actually. Uh, so what I will say is that, you know, as I, as I identified in my talk, there are very significant in, uh, economic information and social changes that are long-term, unstoppable and irreversible happening inside North Korea right now. These, a lot of these things represent the system, the North Korean regime system, losing control over these things. They're losing control over the economy. They're losing control over information. They're losing control over, especially the young generation in North Korea. That's so obviously this young generation is only gonna grow in significance over time. One way or another, this makes the North Korean regime system unsustainable in the long run. The, the you know, 64, $64 million question, of course, is how does that unsustainability play out? And uh, I, for one, would not really jump to, you know, this change is gonna happen along this pathway in 10 years, because I think that that's not really political science, it's more like political shamanism or, you know, magic or something like that. Uh, I don't think that we really have the tools as political scientists to make those kind of predictions. And if you make the comparisons to other countries uh, through history, political science is Scientists are very bad at making those kind of predictions, right? Nobody really saw the collapse of the USSR happening <coughs> before it happened. People were, you know, blindsided by the Arab Spring. People didn't see even the reform and opening of Myanmar, Burma, uh, in the last few years before it happened. So I think that we should be intellectually humble about this. We should say that there are these long-term bottom-up trends uh, and these change trajectories that point towards unsustainability and therefore an adaptation of the system, but this adaptation could happen in different ways. It could actually be an opening. Uh, it could be the North Korean government is actually sensitive to these kinds of changes, and they have reacted in the past, and they are reacting right now, and they will react in the future. So the, the, the crucial question is, when the North Korean government adapts, and they're adapting right now as well, when they adapt to these kind of bottom-up changes, is that adaptation going to be sufficient and are they going to be able to stay on top of an opening uh, system? And that's just something that I don't think that we have the data to make a firm conclusion on right now. So when this happens in five years, 10 years, 15 years, I don't think that we know. And I don't think that we know exactly how it's going to play out. But I'm, I'm fairly confident because there are multiple confounding trends that this kind of significant change will happen in our lifetime. Thank you. I noticed the two people coming forward on the, on the speaker's list. That was reminded that you can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag Civita full cost. Moving on to you, Michael. Uh, it seems to me, while uh, working the international community, that there is little policy, a lot of hostility. You talked a little bit about uh, policy and implementing policy. But if you could be a little bit more specific, yeah, should the European countries uh, go further in dialogue with the North Korean uh, uh, regime. How are we to approach the North Korean regime? Okay, um, sen what should be central to our policy making decisions is, is the, the actual reality of North Korea, not what the regime would like to propagate. And the only way we can really build good policy is by working with the refugee community. As I said during my talk, there are about 30,000 North Koreans um, are refugees around the world, and they have various professional experience. Um, there are diplomats, economists. Um, you heard from Ji Hyun, who was a high school teacher in North Korea. There are farmers. There is pretty much every level of society <coughs> among the refugee community, people who intimately understand the policies of North Korea. And those people need to be kind of those people need to be kind of utilized for for better policy across the European um, across Europe towards North Korea. Uh, as to your kind of specific questions, absolutely the, the focus of policy and um, 
dialogue should be exchanged. We shouldn't cut that off. It should be an important part, but not the only part. You know, you heard extensively from Sokil about the bottom-up changes. We aren't engaging with those changes to any real extent. And to ensure that improvements in human rights happen and to ensure that North Korea becomes not necessarily a democracy at this point, because that's going to take a long process, but less hostile towards its own people. To ensure that happens, we must engage every level of society uh, through dialogue, through policy, through just discussion, really. Thank you. Regine Larian, um, what have been the biggest challenges or problems you face when you're trying to document human rights violations in North Korea? Um, I think the uh, biggest challenge is lack of access to North Korea. Uh, the North Korean government does not allow uh, direct access into North Korea. And even if we are allowed, the question is what danger do we put these North Koreans into? Uh, the other issue is that we cannot go, a lot of North Koreans have been uh, to China, but it's again very difficult to interview them in China, in part because they could be uh, sent back, they could be caught in sent back, so we bring them into great danger. And uh, also because a lot of the stories cannot be told openly. So then there is a time gap. Most of these people like Ji Hyun here uh, have to travel far, uh, say she's in England or we have 26, 27,000 North Koreans now in South Korea. So they then tell the story which are about three, four, five years ago. And then we have to imagine that and build it up. But the good news is that there are many more who are willing to come and tell the stories. And we're putting this patchwork together. And so it's important with people like Sukhil, people like uh, Michael, and also Jihan. It's important to engage with them more and more. And that way we have their inbuilt sources. The last interesting and biggest challenge we face is also that people not, uh, North Koreans don't talk uh, until they are very certain about the security, because as I mentioned in my talk, uh, North Koreans uh, uh, practice what is called the Yon Chiba Jesus, the Kin Chiba Association system. So if somebody reveals an information and their relatives or their families are still there, they could be under risk. So uh, that's another issue which we need to keep in mind. So for instance, when the Commission of Inquiry conducted their uh, research, uh, I think they did, uh, about 80 people came as testimony publicly. But then there were more than 200 who gave confidential interviews, and they had to hide them. Uh, so that, that just reveals the nature of the problem. Thank you. Uh, I noticed uh, seven people together coming on the speech list, so I have to close it now. Because we are going to end in 20, 20 minutes, I will just repeat it, so I'll make sure that I haven't uh, uh, ignored or forgot anyone. Uh, first is uh, Boat, then I also noticed Hans Otto. Uh, and then I noticed uh, Jan of uh, uh, Unfortunately, I don't know the name of everybody here. So uh, the man sitting in the middle there, uh, the lady here, and also the young boy sitting there. So I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. <laughs> and you, of course, as a person. So uh, I start with you both. Remember to be uh, short, so we reach the time limit here. Uh, it's okay, you don't want to be a shaman. But, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you to push on for the whole, uh, whole panel because I guess a lot of people are interested in the what if question. I mean, the breakdown of North Korea at one stage or another. Will it be with a bang or a whimper? And what happens to civil society and what are the greatest changes for the political system, the educational system, and law? So the first question would be based upon what do you imagine would be the challenges for the civil society? Will there be great conflicts, political, <coughs> even, as, I don't know, maybe internal problems, will there be uh, possibilities of a civil war in any way? What happens to the brainwashing, the political understanding of what to do with, with some sort of freedom that arise? And the second is more structural. What are the greatest challenges? For instance, we know from Eastern Germany, when, when the communists collapsed, although East Germany at that stage was a far less totalitarian <coughs> society than the North Korea is, they had huge problems in, in, in um, transforming their education system, for instance, in the law and in the school system, to a, to a more liberal, democratic, or at least modern uh, education system. So, what happens to civil society? What is
is there a possibility for huge conflicts? What does people, how do people react to this thing? That was a very big question, Paul. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, the question is, what happens if a sudden collapse should happen? Uh, I think, yeah, uh, Sakil, if you, if you were to share some thoughts in like one minute about what's the question. Yeah, that's really easy in one minute. Um, obviously, a really big, really important uh, question that, frankly, sometimes there's whole conferences just about one of those questions. Um, it, you know, it, a collapse, uh, a, a collapse could happen in North Korea. It could happen, uh, you know, even before we expect it. Countries, political systems like that, tend to be stable until they're not. You know, you, you can have a very quick change between being stable and unstable. And uh, we've seen, you know, around the country and uh, around the world and through history as well, how bottom-up revolutions can start with a spark. You only need to look to Tunisia a couple of years ago to see how that can happen. Um, and, and, you know, even uh, the French Revolution, for instance, is, it's that kind of process. You don't, have to have, you don't have to have the internet, you don't have to have social media for these things to happen. North Korea doesn't have the internet, but it's not necessarily uh, a, a crucial barrier. If that does happen, then there could be all sorts of problems. Uh, briefly, you know, one of the one of the issues that people sh could think about is that there could be bloodletting. You know, a lot of North Korean people have been oppressed and abused by the government officials in their area, in, the, in their jurisdiction, uh, for a long time with no accountability, with just you know, complete arbitrary power for the government officials. So there's all sorts of abuse which is happening, and so uh, there there could be. A sense that some people want to get revenge when the boot is on the other foot uh, against some government officials. I spoke, I've had those kind of conversations with North Korean refugees as well that have that started off with intense hatred against certain government officials in their local area. When they leave the country and they, they get a, a, a broader perspective, they realize that it's the system which creates those kind of problems, not those individuals. But when they, when you're in that system, of course. Uh, your, your hatred can be directed towards specific officials that have abused you or have, have been the face of that uh, repression. So those kind of, those kind of difficulties uh, could become very real. It's not impossible that you could have a, a very fierce resistance uh, by the Pyongyang ruling elites, which may be somewhat analogous to what's happening in Syria right now. In fact, there's quite a lot of similarities between Syria and North Korea. Syria has a population of about 20 million, I think. North Korea is 24 million. Syria has a, a small ruling elite minority group, you know, the, uh, uh, primarily the Alawites, and, uh, and then a large uh, disempowered majority group that's obviously trying to overturn the system. And so the minority group, is maybe two million people, sure, maybe two million people have a lot of interest in trying to maintain the system because if, they, if the system gets flipped upside down, they could lose everything. Uh, and, and you know this, this is especially pertinent because a collapse of North Korea could lead to reunification with South Korea, whereby the whole ruling elite in Pyongyang, 10 percent, the top 10 percent of the North Korean population, could lose their liberty, their status, their wealth, their power, the networks that they rely on, all those things. So they could fight very hard to maintain the system. Uh, in contrast to a country like Egypt, for instance, where the ruling elite can survive a political uh, change. So there could be these kind of problems. However, I would say that the, the answer to that is not, well, okay, maybe we should be careful what we wish for because the status quo in North Korea is not just you know, unsustainable or untenable, it's also undesirable. We can't say, okay, the status quo is better because the status quo in North Korea is so bad, so we should push for a change, but we should, of course, prepare as much as we can for the possible downstream negative consequences of that change as well. Thank you. I'm going to take two questions in a row and uh, <coughs> just uh, uh, write down some keywords and weigh in if, if, if you'd like. We started with Hansofto and they're up to you. Okay. Uh, present yourself and, uh, and uh, no more than 30 seconds. Thank you so much. I'm, my name is Hansofto Hoffman. I'm a local politician. Um, thank you so for sharing information about this important topic. It was very enlightening to hear about these five min misconceptions. Uh, one of the things we hear mostly in Norwegian news about North Korea is famine and starvation. And from what I know, most of agricultural land is in South Korea. So there is 
isn't much agricultural land in North Korea. So my question is whether this capitalist economy has uh, reduced the danger of famine, or is there still danger of famine? Can we ex expect more famines in the near future? Uh, still, uh, in spite of be uh, becoming a capitalist economy. Th thank you. So the question is uh, whether or not we can expect more famines in North Korea in the near future. Yellow again. Uh, my name is Jan Gutorp. I represent a movement called the International Coalition of Stalin Leaders, and we have uh, lots of uh, leaders in South uh, Korea also. I was intrigued and touched by Ji Yoon's uh, uh, testimony. And I'd like to ask you, knowing that Koreans are such a spiritual people, what, would the, what is your take about the situation for freedom of religious uh, expression? and religious, uh, holding religious beliefs in among the North Korean peoples, both Christian and non-Christians. Thank you, so the question is about spirituality in, in, uh, in uh, North Korea. Michael, if I, I uh, take the first question to you, how do you see uh, the development and the danger for more famines in North Korea? Uh, without fail, almost every year we hear of famine in North Korea, and those reports simply aren't true. There is great food insecurity, no denial about that. But every year we hear reports of thousands of people dying, and that's happened every year since the, the big major famine in the 1990s. Food insecurity <coughs> is still pretty terrible, and access to food is still pretty difficult, but it is improving year upon year upon year. And over the past few years, we've seen harvest levels reaching almost what they were before the famine. Um, but the North Korean state still has to import a lot of food. Um, the FAO and WFP released a report in October, I think it was last year, which said that North Korea still had, uh, even though they had had a very, good a very good harvest, they still needed to import 340,000 tons of food. So there is still a lot of insecurity uh, with access to food. But it, that doesn't preclude a, a famine, I would say. Sure. Jian, you understood the question about how the religious situation in North Korea and spirituality is. So you can answer in Korean and Sakib can translate if you like. Yeah. 북한에는 종교의 자유가 전혀 주어지지 않고 있습니다. 그런데 이제 제가 그 신뢰를 들었을 때 제가 어릴 때부터 이제 교세례 교육을 받았을 때 저희가 한 토픽으로 이제 하나 교육을 받는 거 있는데 이제 1950년도 이제 북한과 남한의 전쟁이 일어날 때 이제 미국 선교사가 이제 북한으로 들어와 있었는데 그때 한 어린이가 이제 그 선교사 옆으로 지나가다가 사과밭에 사과가 떨어진 걸 하나 주워 먹었어요. 그 선교사 안에 사과를 그런데 그 미국 선교사가 나와갖고 이 우리 땅에 있는 사과대 네가 도둑질을 했다고 하면서 이제 이런 새대로 이제 불을 달궈갖고 이제 머리에다가 도둑이라고 생겼어요. 이것이 바로 종교라고 이제 저희한테 배워졌거든요. 그래서 저희는 어릴 때부터 이제 종교가 무엇이고 또 그런 거에 대해서 알지도 못했고 그렇게 하고 자랐는데 지금 많은 분들이 이제 북한을 나오면서 이제 중국으로 가갖고 이제 교회에 대해서 알게 되고 또 교회에 접하고 이러다가 이제 그분들이 이제 북한으로 국성되었을 때 만약에 교회를 믿었다게 되면 북한에서는 그걸 완전 엄중한 죄로 보기 때문에 그 사람들 이제 그런 정치범 수용소에 들어가고 또 이제 시범 단계로서 사형까지도 이제 하고 있거든요. 근데 이제 지금 최근에 제가 BBC 파노라마, 파노라마 그걸 봤을 때 이제 북한에 순복 교회가 이제 존재한다고 하지만 그거는 이제 그 세계에서 모두가 이제 교회에 대한 압박에 대해서 북한에 대해 북한에 이제 모두 이렇게 압박을 하니까 북한에서 그냥 보여주기 식 교회지 실지 북한에는 교회가 존재하죠. Amen. I I I understood BBC panorama, but not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so so here, yeah, please. You don't wanna, you don't wanna take the rest of it as well. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, of course, in North Korea, there's there's no religious freedom to speak of whatsoever. Uh, but Jihan remembers that when you know a specific example is that when she was young, you know there is this uh, intense ideological education, as brainwashing education. And uh, one lesson that the North Korean government uh, you know, tells to uh, the North Korean children is that in the 1950s, uh, during the Korean War, there was an American missionary uh, in, uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and a young Korean child uh, was walking in front and uh, took an apple from the ground, that had fallen on the ground, and ate it. 
the American missionary uh, approached the child and said that you, you've stolen an apple uh, from, from the land. And uh, so they branded you know, with like a, a hot iron on the, the Korean child's head the word bulldog, which is thief. Um, and, you know, to, to brand this child as a thief just for taking an apple. So this is the kind of, you know, this is the kind of uh, education that they say about religion and how it's basically evil, uh, and, and Christianity in particular in North Korea. Now, however, there's obviously North Korean people that are leaving the country, and some of them as refugees, and uh, some of them come into contact with Christians and the churches, uh, including in China. Some of those people then get sent back into North Korea, get forcibly repatriated, and uh, in that case, these people are dealt with uh, in the most severe way. They're sent to political prison camps, and in some cases, they're uh, even executed if they're, if they're suspected of engaging in religious activities and have been contaminated and therefore present a threat in that way to the North Korean system. Um, ji uh, mentioned that she recently watched a BBC Panorama documentary, and in that, they showed a church in North Korea However, she wants to emphasize that that kind of church that they show to foreigners is just a show church. It's just, to, it's just because the international community criticizes North Korea for not having religious freedom, and so they make this kind of show church that they can show to foreign visitors, but you know, it, it, it doesn't represent any kind of actual real religious activity inside the country. Uh, Rajiv, you want to weigh in on the famine? Uh, yes. Um, actually, the other big difference, I'm just adding to what Michael said, uh, the other difference in the 1990s when the famine took place, a lot of people waited because the public distribution system they thought would still deliver. And so a lot of people who died actually died because they obeyed and waited for the state to deliver the food. The big difference now is that people do not wait. They, they know that there is no public distribution system. They depend on the markets. They know how to survive. So even when the harvests have come down a bit, you do not hear of as many deaths or as before. They have made a few, uh, I think three, four years ago, the harvest was down, there were floods, but not many people died because the information system has improved and people do not depend on the government public distribution system. Okay. Can I just make a really quick point? Yeah. We know from really recent refugees as well that we've been able to speak with that there are still deaths from starvation in North Korea, even up until very recently. So there's not, you know, as we've identified, there's not really the danger of a mass famine on the scale of the 1990s, but there are pockets of extreme uh, malnutrition and even deaths from starvation. So there is a case for uh, humanitarian assistance to North Korea, but what I would say is that that humanitarian assistance oh, in the past has been politicized and it has been linked to security issues, probably especially by the US government, if we're being honest. But uh, in the future and from now, this should be based on a needs basis and it should be depoliticized and delinked from those, uh, those kind of things, including just at a strategic level, it doesn't represent uh, effective leverage over the North Korean government, even if you do link it to security aspects. So it, just, it should just be on humanitarian grounds and it should be provided if it meets those conditions. Okay, uh, due to time limits, we will take the rest of the speakers and you will have your final remarks uh, uh, at the last. So please present yourself and be brief. My name is Ed Brown. I work for Stephanus Alliance International. It was very interesting to hear what you had to say, especially about the, the misconceptions. We are probably one of the few organizations in Norway that has worked grassroots level in North Korea. And I've seen many of the things that you presented, the market systems and, uh, and everything. But a quick comment, suggestion, and then I'll drop very a question. Uh, concerning refugees in China, you talked about remittances coming from Europe and from South Korea. But I know that uh, China and UNHCR have an agreement whereby they can enter binding arbitration so that UNHCR can have access. It would be possible to put more pressure on UNHCR and perhaps argue to the Chinese government that it would be beneficial for them to loosen up so that if there's a potential collapse, it won't be as uh, detrimental because more remittances are going across and s uh, stabilizing the society. Thank you.
be done in order for China not to support North Korea? Thank you. So the question is about how we can influence Chinese policy on North Korea. So the two last questions, young boy and George. My name is Valdemar Mushan, and I wonder what is the diplomatic relation between uh, the government in North Korea and China? Yet another question about China, and last. Nils von der Spitze, daytime job the the North Korea task, um, following up on China, assuming that China is as a security member of the international community, what would is there any other peaceful solution to North Korea than China opening up its border, welcoming all refugees, and relocating them to? Thank you. Thank you. So all the questions were more or less about uh, China. So we uh, try to include them in your, your final remarks. I, I would, would like to start with you, John. Do you have any last comments? Uh, what are your thoughts about China? And if you can be very brief. Um, my comment is uh, now we know about North Korean human rights because uh, last year uh, the UN Commission inquiry opened and uh, this year they just finally report in March. So now we all over the world know about the, this human right. So now we just improve this is North Korean human right. So I think it's very important that this is a communication. So I think this communication is uh, two ways. One way is South Korea and one is all over the world. So in March, this is South Korea President Park Geun-hye visited in German Dresden University. And uh, she said just uh, communication about North and uh, South Korea, but uh, this is uh, similar uh, East German and West German this is, uh, before the unification. So uh, I just uh, say this, in South Korea, uh, now there's 26 or 27,000 North Korean refugees in South Korea. So first time is in South Korea must improve to this South Korea and North Korea to pay, to country people communication in refugee communication, but now it's uh, South Korea mm, and South Korea this North Korea refugee and the South Korean uh, detect the communication is very bad. So just example, just water and oil you can't mix. This is similar that so most just is improved this is communication and the mm, second is this is uh, all over the world. This is Europe and all over the world. We just send to North Korea about this, this side, this is freedom, what is freedom, what is happiness. So we now this is work with my this is BBC World Service into North Korea. Yeah. Because before we just everything caught to the this abroad, but now middle 2000, this is uh, not many North Korean people listen to the South Korea radio and uh, watch the news. And uh, North Korea has got uh, internet and uh, computer mobile phone. So we send the uh, uh, DVD, USB, SD cards, and them, and uh, they just uh, uh, watch it uh, outside. Yes, yeah, so I think that is very important. This communication. Thank you. So, what's your take on China's role? Well, yeah, sure. So, of course, China is a really important player. Of course, we should try and in, you know increase cooperation and dialogue with the Chinese government on these issues, including North Korean refugee issues. We should try and encourage them to have a more you know uh, benevolent policy, and maybe turn a blind eye to North Korean refugee flows, and we should discuss uh, you know the international community, South Korea, the U.S. government, other com other governments, uh, and the Chinese government should discuss various con contingency planning for various things that would happen in North Korea in the future as well. However, China has very core interests at stake, um, so we should be realistic about what we can expect and, and how much effort we should devote to that as well. Uh, their policy towards North Korean refugees, for instance, is, rela is uh, related very directly to their relationship with Pyongyang. And uh, you know, a Chinese diplomat I spoke with off the record, I guess I'm kind of putting it on the record right now, but it was a while ago. Um, he basically shared that if they change their policy towards North Korean refugees, the relationship between Beijing and Pyongyang would be burned completely. The North Korean government would take that as a huge, um, you know, a, a huge insult, a, a huge blow, and basically destroy the political relationship between the two countries. So maybe we can, ex maybe it's difficult to expect a change in official policy. There's all sorts of reasons why China's, China has that official policy. We can 
put pressure and try and discourage them to, from having active crackdowns against North Korean refugees and also play a, a bigger role. The other thing that I'll say to, to end is that maybe maybe there's a misconception here as well. You know, we, we look at this issue and we think that it's very difficult and we think that China has a big role to play and therefore we think if only we can get China to change their policy, then maybe we can kind of create a solution on North Korea. However, China is also very constrained in what they can do towards North Korea. They don't actually have a massive amount of leverage that they can use against North Korea. Everybody talks about uh, this political alliance between Beijing and Pyongyang, but consider that Xi Jinping is just about to make a state visit to Seoul, which will be his fourth meeting with the South Korean president, Park geun -hye. He's not had any meetings with Kim Jong-un, and he's not visited Pyongyang. So with that, and, and, and the economic trade relationship between China and uh, South Korea is also much more significant than the economic trade relationship between China and North Korea. So we should think about what this alliance actually represents, what kind of uh, political leverage China actually has on North Korea, and we should be wary of basically outsourcing our efforts and our policy towards North Korea to China, which frankly the US government does. Their answer is often just, you know, on North Korea, well, we're discussing this with the Chinese, we're gonna try and change, get them to change their policy. That's not a policy. That's outsourcing your policy to China, which is uh, kind of ironic, I guess. Um, <laughs> We should, we should, of course, maintain some efforts to increase cooperation, but we should also do these kind of things that enable us to encourage change in North Korea without the compliance of the Chinese or North Korean governments. Strategies that, as I mentioned, are feasible, realistic, pragmatic, and under-resourced at this time. Michael, your final remark? Um, there's a great misconception about DPRK-China relations. You know, everyone seems the, the great quote is um, that relations are like lips and teeth, um, that they're that close. But we saw in uh, December with the execution of Jiang Song Tech that the Chinese are increasingly not very happy with what's going on in Pyongyang. We know they were very, very angry about that execution because he was kind of their point man within um, the Pyongyang elite. Um, <coughs> kind of moving on to the sort of refugee issue, I think we all, even though we're all North Korean human rights activists, we all kind of get sucked into China's dealings with the, ref the North Korean refugees. Whereas, actually, the, ref the North Korean refugee community within China is quite small in comparison to the rest of the refugee um, communities in China. There's about over 300,000 refugees in China, and most of them are Vietnamese. There's something like 270,000, roughly. And the problem isn't so much the UNHCR, because the UNHCR continue um, to try and get access to those refugees. The problem is the lack of domestic legislation within China. China is a, uh, a party to two major treaties on refugees, but they don't really have any kind of <coughs> domestic legislation. So all refugee processing kind of happens through the UNHCR. So in my view, that should be the focus trying to encourage the Chinese government to implement domestic legislation for the protection and processing of refugees. Last minute, uh, final remark, Rajiv. Okay, um, I think uh, hopefully we've uh, shed enough uh, sunlight today. Um, it's still very early in the morning and the talk is pretty really heavy. Uh, but, um, you know, hopefully we've given uh, you some thought on and some more understanding about a very difficult country and a very difficult topic within a difficult country with human rights, uh, the situation in North Korea, and also how the international community is increasingly getting involved at the UN. Uh, there are constraints because we cannot directly engage with this government, and so at one level, you know, there is an idea of people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, there is a diaspora which is increasing. There's an increasing North Korean diaspora which has come up, and that needs to be encouraged. Uh, at the other, at the, they eventually would be the resource of information far better than us. And uh, hopefully, I see in the f near future a panel of North Koreans rather than us sitting here, more like Peter and others, telling their stories. Um, at the other level, it's also in the UN Security Council, you, as I was saying, the Commission of Inquiry is now placed. The Human Rights Council has done its bit. So, they will keep having the uh, you know, human rights resolutions. They have been asked, mandated to give more resources to the special rapporteur. 
to continue research and build up a stronger case for the crimes against humanity in North Korea. But the document should not gather dust. It is an action document. And for that, the UN Security Council has to act. And for that, the international community, Norway and others, need to play a much more active role. And also, uh, uh, countries like China. It's interesting because China increasingly is worried about security issues. They're very unhappy. Uh, in fact, they have co collaborated in the UN to have a uh, sanctions regime on North Korea with security. But of course, with human rights, that's another story at the moment. But the idea is to raise this political pressure to the point that China will also slowly reduce its uh, reluctance uh, or to reduce its veto uh, on issues related to human rights in North Korea. Um, the, the other issue is also that, uh, as we've been discussing, North Korea is changing from within. And I think that process is what's encouraging. And at the end of the day, authoritarian regimes, you know, they, are, they try to protect themselves, because they have no way to go. I mean, it's either, you know, they, they only ways like Jiang Song Tech, death. So uh, Jiang Song Tech is, by the way, the uncle of the present uh, leader, who was number two not so long ago, but who ended up uh, being executed. Uh, but at the other level also, as Jihan was saying, I think the main issue is communication, <coughs> advocacy, uh, making more people aware, and hopefully we've done our job. Thank you. Before we give a hand to the, to the panel, let me end in 20 seconds. First of all, let me apologize for going over time. Uh, second of all, I want to mention that we have uh, our next meeting without further comparison to this meeting. It's about Norwegian agriculture politics. It's on <laughs> Tuesday. And so thank you all for coming. And thanks to you, the panelists. Thank you for sharing your insights on North Korea.